Lecture 16b, Numerical Implementation of Transformation Optics. In the last lecture, we learned about two different types of spatial transforms for designing electromagnetic devices. The way we presented transformation optics, it had one serious drawback in that we needed some kind of closed form equation to describe our transform. Well, what if we don't have that? What if our geometry is rather arbitrary or strange? What can we do? So in this lecture, I'm going to show you how to use the finite difference method, which may not be the most efficient, but it's definitely very simple. So I'll show you how to use the finite difference method to do the spatial transform completely numerically, and then also generating the maps of permittivity and permeability numerically. From there, we would feed that into some kind of simulation. In the past, I've used an anisotropic version of finite difference frequency domain, but it really could be fed into about anything. So with that said, let's dive right into this. The first thing I want to do before we even get into transformation optics is talk about Laplace's equation, because this is what we're going to use to do our spatial transform. And we'll look at this to try to get an intuitive feel of really what does the solution to Laplace equation give. And you'll see that I describe it as an operation to fill in numbers. So I like to informally call it a number filler inner. Given that, we'll move on and learn how to do spatial transforms and calculate arbitrary spatial transforms by solving Laplace's equation. Given that spatial transform that now we've obtained completely numerically, no closed form equations for anything is needed, then we can generate our maps of permeability and permittivity. And what we've done is completely numerically implemented transformation optics. So on to how to numerically solve Laplace's equation, and more importantly, to try to give you an intuitive feel of really what the solution to Laplace's equation is. So this is not yet transformation optics. This is a preliminary tool that we will use in the transformation optics process. So here is Laplace's equation, del squared u equals zero. Think about what this is. That del operator is really a three-dimensional spatial derivative. So del squared, we're performing a second order derivative operation in some way in three dimensions and setting that equal to zero. Well, in one dimension, we interpret the second order derivative as curvature, and it's almost that in three dimensions as well. However, Laplace's equation, we've set that second derivative equal to zero. So if the second derivative is zero, that means there is no curvature. That means we're only finding straight lines. So the conclusion here is that when we solve Laplace's equation, we're finding a function that varies linearly. And you'll see how this is used to interpret Laplace's equation as a number filler in her. So let's say we have this two dimensional space and we have two regions here where for some reason we want to force the lower left to negative nines and the upper right to positive nines. And all the white squares, we don't know what the values are, but we would like to fill them in so that the numbers sort of fade from negative nines up to positive nines in a linear way. We would use Laplace's equation to do that. And when we do, we get an answer that looks like this. And what we can see is that we still have these regions of negative nines and positive nines, the same position they were in before, but we filled in all the other numbers in a way that makes them vary linearly. So in this sense, Laplace's equation is a number filler in her. Now let's think about how we'll actually solve Laplace's equation. So if you've been following these series of lectures, uh, hopefully by this point, you're very familiar with how we implement the finite difference method. Uh, if not, what we're about to go through will confuse you, and I definitely recommend going back and reviewing the lectures on the finite difference method. So we start off with Laplace's equation, and we'll expand it in Cartesian coordinates just in two dimensions. Uh, this works just as well in three dimensions. 
Once we have that partial differential equation, we'll go term by term and write that in matrix form. And finally, we end up in the standard form where we essentially have the Laplace operator as a square matrix. Laplace operator operating on an answer equals zero. And so we use finite difference method to get there. So all we've done so far is put Laplace's equation into matrix form. It's not yet solvable because we have LU equals zero. If we backward divide L, L backward divide zero to calculate U, we'll end up with a trivial solution. So we can't have a zero on the right hand side. And so the information that's missing is where we're forcing values onto our grid. So the second step is to build this function. I'm calling it B which contains zeros everywhere, but where it's not zero, that's going to become a point that we force to a particular value. So at this point, we'll build in our negative nines at the lower left and our positive nines at the upper right, but we could put these anywhere that we need to. So that's our function B. It's our function of forced values. Wherever we're not forcing values, we'll just set to zero. In fact, the way we're implementing this, it doesn't matter what we put elsewhere. Uh, this algorithm will still work, but zeros is convenient. The third step, we want to build what we call a force matrix. This is almost that B function from the previous slide, but we have zeros anywhere that we're not forcing. These are the points where we want Laplace's equation to fill in, and we place ones where we know the value is. So we're placing ones where we had negative nines and positive nines. So it's a map of the points that we want to force values to. We'll take this two-dimensional grid, reshape it to a one-dimensional array, and then insert it along the diagonal of a matrix that we call F. And we call this the force matrix. Then, using a trick that we've covered in previous lectures, uh, we discussed this when we were talking about anisotropic transmission lines and in some other places, using that force matrix F and that column vector B that contained the values we're forcing to, we update our L matrix and our B column vector using the force matrix. So remember what's happening in this equation. This first term is zeroing out the rows where we want to force a value. This F inserts a one in the diagonal position. So we've modified L. And then in B, the B prime just contains all of all zeros everywhere except the forced values where we're forcing the values. So we now have an L matrix and a B column vector for which we can calculate U. This will be the solution to Laplace's equation. So we say L backward divide B and now we've calculated U which comes out as a column vector but if we reshape that back to our 2D grid and plot it this is what we get. And we can see that by solving this matrix equation, we have filled in all of the other values. So we're interpreting Laplace's equation as a number filler inner. We define some regions that have force numbers and Laplace's equation figures out what goes between them in a way that they vary linearly. There's another useful way we can look at this. Suppose we have an enclosed problem where we don't really care what's happening outside of some particular enclosed region, but we want to fill in numbers on the inside. And this will come up when we apply Laplace's equation in spatial transforms. But for now, let's just say we have this boundary around some region with known values. So those need to stay fixed what we want to do is figure out what goes in the middle so that all these numbers vary linearly and smoothly. How can we modify what we've just talked about to do this? The first thing we'll do is make a map M that contains ones where we want to solve Laplace's equation and zeros everywhere else. So at some point, we need to cross off from our matrix equation anywhere that's a zero in this M function and only obtain a solution where there's ones. So we have this B function that tells us our values around the boundary. We don't want to change those. We just want to figure out what goes in the middle so that everything 
tapers linearly and smoothly. All right, so we have this map function that tells us where we want to solve Laplace's equation. The, in concept, what the next step is, we want to look at our big matrix equation and cross off all the rows and columns that correspond to points we don't care about. We will just literally cross them out of the equation, but we want to retain where they came from. So look at the MATLAB code here. The first thing I'll do is extract all of the array indices where M equals one. That's, the, that's where we want to solve. Then what I do is I rebuild matrix L and column vector B, only pulling out those rows and columns that we're actually interested in. Now we have probably a significantly smaller matrix equation, and all we've done is cross off rows and columns. So what remains are only the points that we want to solve. But we're storing this array of indices because we'll need that when we need to go back and rebuild it. So now we solve Laplace's equation, L backward divide B, and we have U double prime. So that's really easy to do in MATLAB. However, that U only contains the points in the region where we want it to solve. We have to think about all the other points and then insert this solution into the correct points in this larger grid, which seems a little bit weird, but it's actually not too bad to do. So the first thing I'll do, little u is really just numbers in this, this region of our, of our main grid. So I'll initialize a big U, which is this entire grid, and then use that end to insert the little u's. And that puts the values that we've just solved in the correct positions in this bigger two-dimensional U grid. The rest of the points we didn't care about. We didn't solve them. Uh, maybe values of those come from some other piece of information, or maybe we just never really do care. But notice, we filled in the numbers. We have those same numbers running around the boundary, uh, but we filled in the numbers in a way that everything's uh, sort of fading linearly across the grid. Maybe I shouldn't have said fade. I should have said grade. So that's it for Laplace's equation. Now let's go on and actually think about how to do a spatial transform using what we've just learned about Laplace's equation. The first thing we need to do on our algorithm for calculating the spatial transform is to construct our object in cloak. We're not using closed form equations for this, so we need to draw pictures. And so the shape of the cloak I'm calling CLK, that's not clock, that's cloak. And then the object I'm just calling OBJ. So in this case, the object is inside the cloak. So eventually inside the cloak, we'll be calculating weird permeability and permittivity values so that if a wave passes through this, the wave wraps around the object and never enters it. And so really our object can be there, the wave reconstructs itself and it's invisible. So we're just drawing pictures. We have zeros anywhere that's empty and we put ones either where the cloak is or where the object is. And we come away with these two arrays. Then what we need to do is detect the edges because we'll be forcing our coordinate values at the edges using Laplace's equation to fill in numbers and you'll see how this works. So we take our cloak array and our object array and do an edge detection with one little trick about this that we cover on the next slide. We eventually want to fill in the cloak region all with numbers. That means when we do edge detection on the cloak, that edge should fall outside of the cloak. When we do edge detection on the object, that edge should fall inside the object such that it is still outside of the cloak. That way no edge points are in the cloak region and the cloak region is really where we wanna do all of our work. This is where we'll be solving Laplace's equation. This is where we'll eventually be filling in permeability and permittivity. So we're doing edge detection just slightly differently for the cloak region and the object region. This is a, an important point to catch.
Okay, so at this point, we have four arrays in memory, the cloak, the object, the edge of the cloak, and the edge of the object. And now we proceed. In this step, we need to generate yet two more two-dimensional arrays that tell us the X coordinates and the Y coordinates at the two edges that we've just found. So the first thing I like to do is just generate my standard mesh grid. And then I OR together my two edges. So I create an array where I want to be forcing values to. So that's be my force matrix. But I have visualized this as a 2D array. I see both edges. Now, if I do a point by point multiplication with those two mesh grid arrays, what I get now are two two dimensional arrays that are zeros everywhere except on the edges. They retain either the values of X or the values of Y. So in a sense, I've isolated my coordinates to the edges of my object and cloak. And so now I come away with this, with this XF and YF array. So the F means this is where we're forcing X values and we're forcing Y values. That's why I've named them that. Now here is where we do the beginning of our transform. In order to render the object invisible, you can see the object here. This is the X values on the boundary and the Y values on the boundary. I want to bring the coordinates at the edge of the cloak to zero. So I'll go in and every point where I have X and Y values, I just set them to zero. And so we end up with a modified version of XF and YF. Again, this is where we're forcing the values of our coordinates. At the edge of our cloak, we're in our standard coordinate system. At the edge of the object, we've brought that to zero. And so the object is sitting right around here, but the X coordinates are all zero. And down here, the Y coordinates are all zero. Now what we need to do is just fill in all the other numbers inside the cloak so that they go from zero where the object is and taper linearly out to the edge where we've stored these X and Y values. And this is where we use Laplace's equation to fill in those numbers. So on the left are our two coordinate arrays where we're forcing our values. And we call Laplace's equation once. Once for the X values, where we want to fill in the numbers, we set our object edge to zero. And we want to fill in the rest of the numbers here. And when we do that, when we solve Laplace's equation to fill in the rest of the numbers, here's where we end up. And we can clearly see our object set to X values of zero, but linearly taping everywhere else. And a very similar thing's happening for Y. We can see all the Y values at the edge of the object set to zero, and all the other numbers are tapering linearly out to the boundaries of the cloak region. So it took two calls or, or two iterations of solving Laplace's equation, one for our X coordinates and one for our Y coordinates. If we were working in three dimensions, we would have yet a third one for the Z coordinates. So that was our spatial transform, and we filled that in with Laplace's equation. Let's look at the numerics now for doing it. We have the pictures. Let's look at the numerics. So the first thing we'll do is we'll build our Laplacean matrix, and we can just do this once. That doesn't, that doesn't change. That stays the same. We also can construct this column vector B. Those were our forced values. So this is where we had the edge of the cloak. We also had the edge of the object, but the edge of the object was forced to zero. That's our B column vector. Then we force those physical boundaries. And so we do that by modifying L and B. At this point, since we only care about filling in the cloak region, we don't care about inside of the object or outside of the cloak. We can cross those off and we reduce our Laplace's equation just solving two points in the cloak region. So that's step three for this. At this point, we can solve Laplace's equation, but this U double prime is only the solution in the cloak region. We need to insert those points back into our full grid, and we know how to do that.
So when we do that, we get those final pictures of what XF and, and YF look like. But we can look at this in a different way. We can look at our grid before and after the transform. Before the transform, we have just an ordinary grid. After the transform, we can see that all the points around the, the, the edge of our object have gone to zero and our coordinates have adjusted themselves around that. So we can see the warping in our grid. Okay, so we learned to use Laplace's equation as a number filler inner. Then we learned how to do a coordinate transformation that's completely numeric. We just drew pictures of our cloak and object. And we learned how to generate the coordinates across that transform grid using Laplace's equation to fill in the numbers. We're almost done transformation optics. The last step is to take those grids and calculate our permittivity and permeability from the transformed coordinates. The first step in this is to initialize our background permittivity and permeability. So if you're implementing this in a computer code, you will have 18 two-dimensional arrays, nine of them for your permittivity tensor elements and nine of them for the permeability tensor elements. And what background material you choose is, is up to you. Here, I'm just initializing to free space. So the diagonal, diagonal tensor elements were initializing all to ones, and all of the off diagonal were initializing all to zeros. And I have the permeability and permittivity set to be the same thing. The next thing we want to do, uh, because to build our Jacobian, we need derivatives of our transform coordinates. And so what we'll do is we'll go back to our transform coordinates and use those derivative matrices we calculated to actually perform the numerical differentiation. And we only need four of these working in two dimensions. So we need the X derivative of the X coordinates, the Y derivative of the X coordinates, the X derivative of the Y coordinates, and the Y derivative of the Y coordinates. So we come away with this with four 2D arrays. And that's really only four lines of MATLAB code to do this. We've already constructed those derivative matrices. And at the end of doing our, our spatial transform, we came away with our transform coordinates that we're just calling X prime and Y prime here. Now we're ready to proceed. At this point, we set up a big double for loop that will raster through our two dimensional grid. Step one in this big loop is to grab the background values of permittivity and permeability, and for whichever point we're currently looking at inside of our loop, build the two tensor, the permeability and the permittivity tensor. So these are just nine by nine, describing the permeability and permittivity at whichever point our double loop happens to be focusing on. So we build that background mu and epsilon tensor at that specific point. At this point, we need to build the Jacobian. And that was discussed in the previous lecture. Uh, maybe this step won't make a whole lot of sense unless you've watched that. But we do a very similar thing, but we go to these four arrays where we've calculated derivatives and we build this three by three little matrix by grabbing the points out of those four 2D arrays for whichever point our double for loop is, is looking at. And we populate that Jacobian. And we'll use that Jacobian then to transform our tensors. So that's the next part. So we actually invert the Jacobian because we've done our, our transform backwards. And that's because all the coordinates on the edge of the object, if we started with that to be zero, um, we can't just fabricate zero coordinates into something else. So we did it backwards where we took our object and actually transformed it to zero. So rather than operate with a Jacobian, we operate with the inverse of the Jacobian and we transform this mu r and e r, which are nine by nine tensors, I'm sorry, three by three tensors, and we transform them and we calculate the mu and epsilon uh, for our cloak, just using that Jacobian, the inverse of the Jacobian. Now, once we have those two tensors, we then go back to our big 2D arrays and repopulate it with our new values. 
And so those were the steps that we have in this big double for loop. We extract our permeability and permittivity arrays. We build the Jacobian. We use that to transform our permeability and permittivity. And then we put those nine values from each tensor back into our big 2D grids. And if we do this for all points, we end up with our final answer. And here is our final answer for both the permeability and permittivity. And the white regions here is probably just ones or zeros for the off diagonals. I'm only showing the permeability and permittivity where the cloak region is. And in fact, if we were to pass a wave through this magical material, the wave would appear to bend around the object and render that object invisible. And that's it. That is the full numerical implementation of transformation optics.